Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. Today we are going to do the 13th lecture and with this we are going to begin a series of four lectures on India-China relations. So these four lectures are going to deal with four different periods in the history of India-China relations. Today's lecture is going to deal with the period from say around 300 BCE to 1949 and, and in this we are going to look into the geopolitics of India-China relations and the boundary dispute between the two countries. In the next lecture which is going to be uh, which will cover the period from 1949 to 1962 we will deal with Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai and the 1962 war. Then from 1962 to 1993 would be the third lecture which will look into various issues of conflict and peace between the two countries and then from 1993 to 2021 would be a period of strategic competition between the two countries. So, we will we'll close the lectures with the, the conflict in, in Galwan Valley. So, in today's lecture, let us uh, let's look at geopolitics and boundary dispute. Now, geopolitics is an interaction between three different, uh, uh, three different forces. There is uh, history, there is geography and there is ideology that determine how humans act. And so, uh, it, it, it influences the political system, the, the various strategies the leadership, so all those come under the ideological aspect. Uh, then uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the geographical aspect, of, co of course the terrain, the rivers, the mountains, so those are very important in, in geopolitics. And then historical aspect is, is, uh, is how things have evolved till that particular period of time. So how the things started and how they have gradually developed. So, when all these three factors come together, when there is an interaction between the three, whatever comes out of it, that is known as geopolitics. So, let us begin uh, say with the idea. So, this is the Republic of India. This is the sovereign territory of India with his uh, uh, states and union territories. And uh, it is a republic. India is a republic. It is a democratic republic, sovereign democratic republic. It uh, has an elected government. It is the largest democracy in the world and very proud of, of uh, that status. It is also a, a developing country. Uh, still, uh, the per capita income is quite low, although growing very fast and it is the fifth largest economy in the world. And in terms of the economic system, it is uh, a, a liberalized economy. There is some portion of the economy that is state owned. Uh, and there is also welfare done by the state, but in the rest of the economy there is uh, free enterprise. So, people can freely engage in economic activities. So, this is basically the idea that, that, that uh, has created uh, India. In terms of uh, ethnicity and religion, it is uh, a diverse country different languages and cultures prevail within India, all the way from the north to the south, from the east to the west, there is a lot of diversity. In terms of religion, almost 80 percent of the population is considered to be Hindu and then there are some minorities, the largest minority being the Muslim minority. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir is the only uh, Muslim majority union territory. It used to be a state when uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh were together, but uh, now they have been bifurcated into two. So, there is Union Territory of Ladakh and Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. So, Jammu and Kashmir is the only Muslim majority, about 70% of the population 
is Muslim. Then in terms of, uh, say, uh, in terms of Christians, um, some of the northeastern states are Christian majority. For example, Nagaland, Mizoram, and Meghalaya. These are three Christian majority states. Uh, Arunachal has large number of Buddhists and Ladakh also has almost 50 percent Buddhist population. So, there is a lot of religious diversity also, but overwhelmingly in the rest of the country or, or, and I, I forgot to mention Punjab. Punjab is a Sikh majority state, uh, and, but the rest of the country is all Hindu majority and overall Hindus are 80 percent of the population. So, this is the brief kind of a ideological uh, standing of India as a nation. Then towards the north east of India lies China. So, India would be here and then this is China. China also has its provinces. Um, there is a lot of diversity in China also in terms of uh, if you look at the entirety of China. However, in terms of proportion of population, more than 90 percent of Chinese population is Han Chinese. That is, these people have uh, Chinese language as their mother tongue, although there may be different dialects. For example, the Mandarin dialect spoken in, in Beijing or there could be Cantonese dialect which is spoken in Kwantong. So, there are different dialects, but it, it has a common script and it is considered to be a common Chinese heritage. So, they are known as the Han Chinese. All these pink states are all dominated by the Han Chinese population. And then there are autonomous regions which are minority uh, provinces. So, Tibet autonomous region is for the Tibetans, then there is Xinjiang Uyghur autonomous region for Uyghurs, then there is Ningxia Hui autonomous region for the Hui population. Hui are uh, Chinese speaking Muslims. So, they are known as Hui, uh, while Uyghurs are Turkic Muslims, uh, Tibetans are Buddhist, so are Mongolians. So, Inner Mongolia autonomous region is for the Mongols, Mongols are also Buddhist. And then in the, in the south you can see there is a Kwangxi, Chuang autonomous region, Chuang is another uh, minority in China. Then they also have something known as special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau which follow one country, two system. And then you can see Taiwan, Taiwan, these are the Taiwan Straits and uh, this separates the island of Taiwan from the mainland China. So, Taiwan is more or less an independent country, a de facto independent country. It calls itself Republic of China, but China believes that there is only one China and Taiwan is only a part of China. So, this is a basic uh, kind of a geographical understanding of China. In terms of political system, China is a people's republic. So, it is a communist dictatorship, one party rule. There are some other smaller parties, but they are all subordinate to the communist party. There are no free and fair elections. Uh, everything is managed by the communist party. All the candidates are selected by the communist party and wh whomever the party decides, they get elected to the parliament, National People's Congress. And often there is one leader who is known as the paramount leader. Right now, Xi Jinping is the paramount leader and uh, for, a, for a few years, China followed the collective leadership model. So, although there was one paramount leader, but there were other leaders who also were very important. But under Xi Jinping, all other leaders have been sidelined and Xi Jinping is, you can say, one man dictator of China. So, there is one man ruling over one party and there is one nation. So, it is a kind of a hierarchical system. So, you can see by nature, India and China are completely different. India is very robust and uh, argumentative democracy. China is very disciplined, one party, one man rule, no one can speak against the leader. So, so it is completely different, two different types of countries. Now, geographically, we saw that near neighbors, this is China here, this is India here. Now, both countries are located in Asia and within the Indo-Pacific region. This is the Indian Ocean, this is Indo and this is the Pacific Ocean, Pacific. So, this region, this whole region is known as the Indo-Pacific region. So, both these countries are located inside the Indo-Pacific region. The great Himalayas separate the two. So, these are the great Himalayan mountains here. They separate India and China and therefore, in history, India and China have never been in conflict because in the past, te technologically it was not possible to cross the Himalayas with, with large armies. And so, Indian rulers never went into China to invade them or the Chinese rulers never came to India to occupy India. 
Of course, there is then Tibet in between them. Tibet has always been a buffer between India and China historically. And because of that, it was not possible for China to enter into India. Of course, um, scholars have come in, but uh, never armies. So, and ideas have also fallen. This is the Silk Road going all the way from China into Europe. And India was also part of the Silk Road. Iran was also part of the Silk Road. So, in this way, ideas travel. In, in, in this way, scholars travel, monks travel, Buddhist monks, uh, but never armies. But since the 1950s, it has been technologically possible to cross the Himalayas. And because China came, has come to occupy Tibet, because of that, the buffer is gone. There is no longer a buffer between India and China. China is right at our borders now. China is right here. Except the Himalayas, there is nothing stopping China from invading India. And so, they did in 1962, they invaded India. And from time to time, we, we get the news that the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army has infiltrated into Indian territory and the Indian Jawans, the Jawans of the Indian Army have responded and also the officers have bravely responded. So, China in that sense is a geopolitical challenge to India. Then India in order to counter China has also developed relations with other important powers in Asia Pacific. For example, United States. United States is the only superpower in the world. It is present everywhere. And so, uh, India uh, collaborates with the US to counter China. Plus, it is joined by Japan and Australia. So, this is known as the Quad, Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. India, US, US has a base here, Diego Garcia. US is also in the Middle East. US is also in, in Southeast Asia. US is everywhere. So, US, India, Japan and Australia together have formed the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue in order to counter the Chinese threat in the Indo-Pacific region. If you look at the, uh, the names of countries here, so this is the same thing just that in this map the names of countries are mentioned. Now China has very close relations with Pakistan. Now Pakistan has occupied a portion of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh and China also has a portion of Ladakh. So there is a boundary between in, uh, China and Pakistan because of that. And so they have built a Karakoram highway here and, and, and China is basically aiding Pakistan which is for all practical pur purposes, an enemy state of India. China is also trying to in, uh, influence other neighbors of India like Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. And so, there is a diplomatic game going on here. On the other side, India is also developing good relations with Chinese neighbors like Japan, Mongolia, you know, Vietnam. So, there is a this competition going on between the uh, two countries. In the final lecture of, of, uh, among these four on India-China relations, we are going to discuss uh, in more details the competition between India and China. Now, let us look at the historical background. Both India and China are ancient civilizations. The Chinese civilization began on the banks of the Yellow River. And from there, it gradually expanded from the Yellow River to north and towards the south towards the Yangtze River. And this is the Han dynasty period when China was more or less united as one nation, which is today say Han Chinese dominated area, not the minority areas. You can see these are not part of the Han dynasty empire. So, this is around 200 BCE. Similarly, the Indian uh, civilization begins on the banks of the Indus river. That is from here, there we get the name India. So, this is the Indus river, Indus and its tributaries and the Saraswati river. So, seven rivers. So, this is, these are known as uh, the Sapta Sindhu. So, on the Sapta Sindhu, bank of the Sapta Sindhu, the Vedic texts were written and from there, then the Vedic civilization spreads towards the east and we have the Upanishads and Buddhism and Jainism emerging in uh, around Bihar in India. And then uh, to, in the east, in Bengal and Assam, we have the Shakti cults, the worship of the goddess. And then in the south, we have these famous temples of Shiva and Vishnu. So, so basically, the, the Indian civilization is an amalgamation of 
the Vedic concept, the uh, the Upanishadic and Buddhist and Jain concepts, and then the worship of the goddess and Shiva and Vishnu and many other gods. And related to that, there are festivals and and uh, social organization, so on and so forth. So all that coming together build the the Indian civilization. And then under the Mauryas, so Chanakya, the great political strategist, under his leadership, uh, Chandragupta Maurya, he became the first emperor when he united India all the way from, you can see, uh, southern part of Afghanistan all the way to the Indian. So the, from the Himalayas to the ocean, India was united and under a Chakravarti Samrajya of Chandragupta Maurya. In China, similar thing was done by Shu Wangti, who was the first emperor. And that was the, the the Qin dynasty. And so, and the names of the countries also, you know, are very interesting. The name China actually comes from China in Sanskrit. And this is in reference to the, the Qin dynasty. So, the Qin dynasty, because it was ruling China, so the people there came to be known as China in Sanskrit. To the north of the Himalayas live, live the China people according to the Sanskrit text. So, that was then adopted by the Westerners and they called this country as China. Similarly, India was referred to as Intu in Chinese, Intu, which comes from Hindu or Hindu. Okay. So, Indus River, Indus River. So, so this is Intu. So, this is basically, as you can say, the beginnings of the two great civilizations. And these civilizations then came in contact through the Silk Road. So, this is the famous Silk Road starting from China and then in a, a, a part of the route connected it with India and then it went all the way into Europe. And there was also maritime uh, dimension to this. So, Indians, Chinese and the Middle Eastern people, you know, they were engaged in maritime travel and trade and so on and so forth and colonization of different islands and uh, unoccupied territories. So, all these things were going on. Now, the idea that actually uh, was uh, became a bond between India and China was Buddhism. So, Buddhism was born in in eastern part of India and uh, say around India, Nepal border, that region, Buddhism developed and then from there Buddhism traveled to different parts of India. And then I showed you about the, the, the Mauryan Empire. So, the third ruler of the Mauryan Empire, Ashoka. He was uh, the grandson of Chandragupta Maurya. He was a Buddhist. He converted to Buddhism and he inherited this huge Chakravarti Samrajya, the great empire. And But he did not use the power to conquer foreign lands. He did not uh, say try to conquer other, other nations. Instead, he wanted to do Dharma Vijaya, conquer people through Dharma, through the words of Buddha. And so, he sent missionaries everywhere. To so Sri Lanka was converted to Buddhism. He also sent missionaries to the western neighbors of India, the Greeks and so on and so forth. Gradually, Buddhism became uh, more popular. Other kings also supported Buddhism and through the Silk Road during the Han Dynasty period, Buddhism for the first time traveled to China. Then uh, a great Buddhist monk, Kumara Jiva, he traveled to China. He was a great scholar. He translated Sanskrit texts into Chinese and he is still respected in China and he is the founder of Mahayana Buddhism in China. So, Ch so Mahayana Buddhism is basically uh, based on the idea of Bodhisattvas, that there are certain realized people uh, who can get liberation from this samsara, but they choose not to because they want to help others. So, these great Bodhisattvas then uh, uh, take reincarnation in this world and help uh, uh, the ordinary people to advance in their spiritual sadhana. And some of them are so powerful that they have created heavens known as pure land. And so, uh, that form of Buddhism, this is Mahayana Buddhism is known as pure land Buddhism. So, say there is one pure land created by Amitava. So, Amitava Pure Land is, is very popular in China. So, Pure Land Buddhism is a popular form of Buddhism in China. Then there is another form of Buddhism that was developed by Bodhi Dharma. Bodhi Dharma was also an Indian monk. He was a, 
it is said that he was a prince, a Pallava prince from sa South India. He traveled all the way to China and he started the Shaolin Monastery, which is the most famous Buddhist monastery in China. You must have all heard about Shaolin Kung Fu. So, Kung Fu was born in Shaolin and uh, Bodhidharma was actually the creator of this form of martial arts. So, he started a form of Buddhism known as Chan Buddhism, which uh, when it went to Japan, it became Zen Buddhism, Zen Buddhism and in, in, uh, with that name, it became popular in the West. Uh, actually, the Sanskrit word for this is Dhyana. So, Dhyana becomes Chan in Chinese, it becomes Zen in Japanese. So, this is a bit iconoclastic, it is not about going to this uh, heavens created by Bodhisattva, but it is about meditation, dhyana, concentration. Okay. So, this is another popular form of Buddhism in China. Then many Chinese monks, they travel to India. The two most famous are Fasian, who travelled during the Gupta dynasty period. They went to um, India and uh, in India, they studied uh, Buddhist texts and uh, uh, they wrote records of uh, or reports of their travels to different parts of India and from their writings we know about the Indian society during that period. The most famous one is Swenzang. Swenzang which mistakenly is writ uh, written as Huensang in Indian history books. I do not know why it is written like that but his name is Swenzang. So, he travelled to India during the time of Harsha Vardhana and uh, uh, Kumara Bhaskar Varman was the king of Kamrupa. So, he has also written extensively on India. In fact, he carried a lot of Sanskrit texts with him to China, which were preserved. Actually, in India, during the Islamic invasion, a lot of uh, Sanskrit texts were destroyed. But they are still in China because it was taken by uh, Swenzang to China and then translated into Chinese. And then from Chinese, they were translated into Tibetan. So, they are preserved in the Chinese and Tibetan languages. There is a famous Chinese uh, classic known as Journey to the West, which is based on the travels of Swenzang to India. So, Swenzang travels through the difficult terrain of Tibet and Himalayas and he is attacked by different tribes and, and ghosts and demons and so on. And so, the monkey king appears to protect him. So, monkey king is a very popular character in Chinese literature. So, this, this character uh, basically protects Suen Chang from all the dangers and he is very mischievous. So, he is often co compared to the Indian Hanuman in, in the Chinese discourse. So, very interesting. So, although India and China never had any military conflict between them in the ancient times, but there was exchange of ideas and, and it was one way basically Buddhism traveling from India to China. Uh, Hu Shi, the famous uh, Chinese uh, scholar. He, he said that India conquered China without sending a single soldier through ideas, through Buddhism. Uh, besides uh, Chinese Buddhism, there is also another form of Buddhism that is the Tibetan Buddhism. Now, Tibetan Buddhism was later than Chinese Buddhism. Chinese Buddhism is basically Mahayana Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism is uh, Vajrayana Buddhism. Okay, Mahayana and Vajrayana, they are two different. Uh, Vajrayana is a form of Mahayana. Mahayana means the great vehicle, so it goes very fast. Vaj Vajrayana, so it comes from Vajra, so Vajra, Yana. That means lightning vehicle, super fast. So this is based on Tantra. So in the eastern part of India, Tantra was very prominent. So when Buddhism spread there, so in Bengal, that area, it took a new form that came to be known as Tantric Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism. So when the Tibetan Empire was growing in the 7th century, on the one side was the Tang dynasty of China, on the other side were the Arab uh, Umayyad Caliphate. The Tibetans were, because they formed an alliance and they were able to stop the Tibetans in between. So, the Tibetans tried to invade south into India. They invaded India, but because of their invasion, they learned about these Vajrayana Buddhist ideas and became Buddhist. So, they came to India, they took Buddhism and then they themselves became Buddhist. So, this is the Tibetan form of Buddhism where there are a lot of uh, lamas who are considered reincarnation of great deities. So, Dalai Lama for example is the reincarnation of Avalokiteshvara. It is a great uh, uh, 
passionate DT who wants to uh, save all the living entities of this world. And like that, there are thousands of lamas in, in Buddhism. And they also worship all kinds of different gods. They, they build different uh, mandalas and worship them. There are a lot of tantric rituals. For example, Kala Chakra is a very famous uh, tantric ritual. So, in that way, Tibetan Buddhism is different from Chinese Buddhism. Chinese Buddhism is more uh, simplistic in that way, where Tibetan Buddhism is more complex. So, so, although we can say both Tibetans and Chinese follow Buddhism, but they are actually quite different. And also the language is different because the Tibetan language is based on the Sanskrit uh, grammar of Panini, there is Ka Ka Ga Ga, while the Chinese language is based on pictorial scripts. There are no, uh, no uh, uh, alphabets in the Chinese language, they are all, each word is a separate picture. Uh, so, in that way, Tibet and China are two, civilizationally two different entities. Tibet being closer to India civilizationally than say Tibet and China. Okay, so, but, but of course, Tibet has now been captured by China. So, Tibet would also fall under China in the geopolitical sense. Now, the next uh, period of interaction between India and China was during the colonial period. So, there are many colonial powers who tried to dominate India, but eventually the British Empire emerged as the, the supreme power in India. By 1857, the British were the rulers of India all the way from the borders of Afghanistan to the Indian Ocean, the British were the rulers. So, they also founded some kind of a Chakravarti Samrajya in India. So, the pink portion are directly ruled by the British and the yellows are the princely states who accepted the paramountcy of the British. At the same time, China was being ruled by the Qing dynasty. The Qing are actually originally people from Manchuria. They are not uh, Han Chinese, but a different culture, which is closer to the Mongol culture. Their language is also a bit different. And they were also influenced by Tibetan Buddhism rather than Chinese Buddhism. But these uh, Manchus gradually captured, uh, they crossed the Great Wall, this is the Great Wall of China. So, they crossed the Great Wall and you can see the years in which they captured these provinces mentioned in this map. So, gradually they conquered the whole of China, also including uh, Mongolia and Xinjiang province, Tibet. So, all these were conquered by the Manchus and so they built this great Qing Empire. The dynasty was known as the Qing dynasty. But gradually, uh, in the competition between the West and China, the West overtook because of the industrial revolution. The West became far more powerful than uh, China and the British were of course the most powerful country in the West, the British Empire. Uh, so when the British and Chinese came in conflict, that, that uh, those, those conflicts are known as the opium wars and these wars were fo fought over opium and I have already discussed in the previous lectures in details about the opium wars. So, Indian soldiers participated in these wars because the Indian sepoys fought for the British. So, the Indian soldiers went to China and they participated in the opium wars. They also participated in the Boxer Rebellion. So, in China, there is an anger towards India because in the Chinese narrative, Indians are portrayed as the sepoys of the West. So, Western powers, the Indians are basically the B team of the Western powers in that sense. They have always helped the Western powers to suppress China. So, that is the typical understanding of the Chinese about India. It was not like that before. In the ancient times for the Chinese, India was the western heaven, the land of Buddha from where you have to get all the knowledge. But the modern discourse after colonial period is India, Indians are basically the B team of the west. They want, Indians do not think good of China, but they want to destroy in, uh, China. That is the Chinese understanding of India. Then there is the Young Husband Expedition of 1903-1904. So, the British, because of the great game. So, this great game was or played between the Russian Empire and the British Empire. The Russian Empire was expanding from the north, trying to reach the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. While the British Empire was moving towards the north, from the ocean it was moving towards the, across the Himalayas towards Central Asia. So, basically, there was every chance of a war between the Russian Empire and the British Empire. 
But there were some countries in between, for example, Iran, Afghanistan, Tibet. So the British policy was in the great game to gain foothold in these uh, buffer countries so that the Russians can't have influence in them. Because if Russians take over these countries, then the British Empire in India would be threatened. And India was the, the, the crown jewel of the British Empire, the most profitable territory of the British. So they didn't want any threat to their Indian Empire. And therefore, in Tibet, they sent the young husband expedition in 1903, uh, who was a British officer. And uh, with his modern weapons, he was easily able, able to defeat the Tibetans and uh, he got concessions from them. There's a treaty that was signed in which uh, the British were allowed to retain some of their troops in Tibet. And the Tibetans ensured that no other foreign power will be allowed in Tibet so that India is secure. Okay, so this was a British, British achievement. But for the Chinese, this, is, this was a part of the, their century of humiliation. This was another humiliation uh, uh, made uh, by the British against the Chinese. So all these achievements of the British were finally solidified in the Shimla Convention of 1914. This was after the collapse of the Qing dynasty. China, China had that time become the Republic of China and it did not have any control in Tibet. Tibet had become de facto independent under the 13th Dalai Lama. China was ruled by the Republic of China. Yuan Shikai was the president. And uh, in India, the British ruled, okay, East India Company rule had ended and it was uh, uh, directly ruled by the British government. So in Shimla, the head of the British delegation was Sir Arthur Henry McMahon. The Chinese representative was Ivan Chan. The Tibetan representative was Shatra Paljor Dorzi. Now there was uh, discussions here in Shimla and the British of course were in a superior position and uh, eventually there was an agreement between the three sides. But uh, Ivan Chan refused to uh, initial acceptance of the agreement under British pressure and after some negotiations subject to ratification by the central government. But when Ivan Chan returned to China, the Chinese government refused to ratify this treaty. So, uh, the British and the Tibetans went ahead and finalized this treaty. Okay, this is known as the Shimla Convention of 1914. And this divided the uh, boundary between India and Tibet in the eastern sector. Okay, let's, let's look at some of the, I have selected certain important articles. Let's look at some of the important articles of this convention. Article 2, the governments of Great Britain and China Recognizing that Tibet is under the sovereignty of China and recognizing also the autonomy of outer Tibet engaged to respect the territorial integrity of the country and to abstain from interference in the administration of outer Tibet, including the selection and installation of Dalai Lama, which shall remain in the hands of the Tibetan government at Lhasa. The government of China engages not to convert Tibet into a Chinese province. The government of Great Britain engages not to annex Tibet or any portion of it. So basically, this article recognizes the autonomy of Tibet. The Tibet should not be become a province of China. It should remain autonomous. At the same time, the British also guaranteed that British won't annex Tibet. So it will remain a buffer between China and India. This was the agreement. In, in this uh, article, there is an interesting word, Outer Tibet. Now, what is Outer Tibet? In this convention, a map was drawn. So, this is the map. And uh, Tibet was divided into two parts. You can see this part here, this, this blue line. South of this blue line, this was known as Outer Tibet. And this area here, this was known as Inner Tibet. Okay, the same formula was followed in Mongolia also. There was Outer Mongolia and Inner Mongolia. Inner Mongolia was annexed by, by China, while Outer Mongolia became independent. Now, here the idea was the Inner, inner Tibet 
would be annexed by China, it would be directly ruled by China, while outer Tibet would remain autonomous. Okay, so inner Tibet was annexed and made part of mostly the Qinghai province and the Sichuan province. Okay, the, the southern part, this is uh, Eastern Kham and this is Amdo, Amdo and Eastern Kham. So these were annexed by China and made part of Chinese province, while outer Tibet was guaranteed its autonomy. It will remain under the suzerainty of China. So technically, China would, would have a title claim over Tibet. So Tibet uh, won't declare itself to be fully independent. Okay, it will be a tributary state of the Chinese government, but internally it will remain autonomous. So basically, the British created a buffer between India and China. And uh, they also decided on the boundary between India and China. So India and Tibet basically. So that is known as the MacMahon line. This is the MacMahon line. South of this today is the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh. This is the MacMahon line. And uh, named after Arthur MacMahon. And this is basically the Myanmar or the Burmese part of the MacMahon line. So uh, Burma at that time was an Indian province. It was uh, ruled by the British directly as a province of, of the Indian Empire. So the MacMahon line does not extend just to India but goes into Burma also. Okay, so, so that is outer inner Tibet and outer Tibet. China also guaranteed that they won't interfere in the selection and installation of the Dalai Lama. It is the Tibetan government who is going to decide who the next Dalai Lama would be. Okay. And they will also respect the territorial integrity of outer Tibet. They won't. So once Tibet has been divided into inner and outer, the outer Tibet territory would be left untouched by the Chinese. They would, won't alter it. Okay. Let's look at the next article, article number three. Recognizing the special interest of Great Britain in virtue of the geographical position of Tibet in the existence of an effective Tibetan government and in maintenance of peace and order in the neighborhood of the frontiers of India and adjoining states, the government of China engages except as provided in Article 4 of this convention, which basically is that if Chinese officials uh, visit uh, Tibet, they will be accompanied by certain guards and those guards won't be more than 300 except that won't uh, send troops into outer Tibet, nor station civil or military officers, nor establish Chinese colonies in the country. Should any such troops or officials remain in outer Tibet at the date of the signature of this convention, they shall be withdrawn within a period not exceeding three months. And in return, the government of Great Britain also engages not to station military or civil officers in Tibet, except as provided in the convention of September 7, 1904. This is the young husband expedition. So whatever rights the British got during that expedition, they will remain. But beyond that, the British won't send any troops or establish any colonies in Tibet. So basically, Tibet would remain independent both of China and the British, that is the Indian government, the British Indian government. Only that the Chinese would remain the suzerain power. The title of uh, the central government would remain with China, but they will treat Tibet as an autonomous uh, country. They won't intervene. Article 9 states, for the purpose of the present convention, the borders of Tibet and the boundary between outer and inner Tibet shall be as shown in red and blue respectively on the map attached here too. I have already shown you the map. So this article basically says that this is how the inner and outer Tibet are defined. But the Tibetan government will also have rights in inner Tibet, which would include the power to select and appoint high priest of monasteries and to retain full control in all matters affecting religious institutions. So although the Chinese government would administer inner Tibet, but in, in the religious policy, the Tibetan uh, government would have precedence. 
like appointing lama. So, religious policies would remain under the Dalai Lama who is the head lama of Tibet. Okay, so, Shimla convention was very important in from, uh, from a point of view of India-China boundary. Further, there were some notes attached to the Shimla convention. Number one, it is under and this was negotiated by Ivan Chan. Okay, he ensured that these were mentioned in the, so that there is no dispute later on. Now, what are these points? Number one, it is understood by the high contracting parties that Tibet forms part of Chinese territory. Okay, so, Tibet is part of China. Number two, now this is not something which people say that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru first uh, mentioned or say Atal Vyari Vajpayee in 2003, Nehru in 1954. It was already accepted by the British in 1914. Number two, after the selection and installation of the Dalai Lama by the Tibetan government, the later will notify the installation to the Chinese government whose representative at Lhasa will then formally communicate to His Holiness the titles consistent with his dignity, which have been conferred by the Chinese government. Okay, so, Tibetan government will select the Dalai Lama and then they will notify it to the Chinese government, which will offer additional titles, which uh, the Chinese government has historically offered to the Dalai Lama. Number three, it is also understood that the selection and appointment of all officers in outer Tibet will rest with the Tibetan government. Outer Tibet shall not be represented in the Chinese parliament or in any other similar body. Now, this is very important. This shows that Tibet was not fully a part of China. It had a lot of autonomy. Okay, Because if it was fully a part of China, it would have some representation, even autonomous territories have some representation in the central government or the central parliament, but not in the case of Tibet. Additionally, there was a Anglo-Tibetan declaration saying that if in case the Chinese government does not ratify the convention, then the British and the Tibetan government would go ahead and finalize it. Okay, so yeah, so uh, this is there is another note in, in, in the publication of this particular convention uh, which says that the Chinese plenipotentiary was uh, did not sign or ratify the uh, the treaty although although he initi initialed it it was not signed or ratified by the Chinese government but uh, Tibet and British went ahead and and finalized it or accepted it so that is the issue. Now, the, because the Chinese government did not accept the Shimla convention, they have not accepted the McMahon line. Okay, this is, so this is the McMahon line here. And they claim the most of the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh as Chinese territory. Okay, so in the Chinese maps, Arunachal Pradesh, most of it, some part is excluded, as you can see this part is excluded, but most of Arunachal Pradesh, they claim to be Chinese territory. So, this is a dispute between India. In, of course, Arunachal Pradesh is an Indian state. There is an elected government, a legitimate government, uh, but China claims it to be its territory. So, this is known as the eastern sector. Okay, India China boundary is a very long boundary. Okay, in the eastern sector, there is uh, 1140 kilometer long boundary, which is under dispute. Okay, dispute one from the Chinese side, of course, the Chinese because they have not accepted the McMahon line. India accepts the McMahon line uh, signed by, uh, which, which was part of the Simla Convention signed by both the British government and the Tibetan government. Then there is the, the western sector. Okay, so in the western sector, unlike the McMahon line, there is not a, a, a treaty which defines the boundary between India and China. In fact, there are different lines which were suggested by different at different times by different uh, British uh, diplomats and administrators. So the in official Indian position is that the Johnson Ardak line is the official boundary between India and China. So this is the 
This is the actual boundary between India and China. This is the Johnson line. Okay. Uh, a British surveyor called William Johnson in 1865, he, he explored this area. Now this, this area was not directly ruled by the British. It was part of the state of Jammu and Kashmir ruled by the Maharaja. So the Maharaja accepted the Johnson line and the British government also accepted it in 1897. So John Ardeck, he was the British official who accepted. Therefore, it is known as Johnson Ardeck line. The, the, but the British were never really very clear about, about what should be the line. There was another line suggested. This was suggested by George McCartney. Okay, George McCartney suggested this uh, uh, this particular line here, uh, the uh, the green line. as the boundary between India and China. Now, uh, this was, he, he was the consul general of, of the British in Kashgar. Okay. Now, Claude Macdonald, who was a British official in 1899, he, he, he supported this particular line. And so, this is known as mccartney Macdonald line. So, basically, there are two lines. One is johnson Ardeck line, the other is mccartney Macdonald line. Okay, so, the British uh, were never really clear about which exactly is the boundary between India and China in this area. So, this is Aksai Chin. This area is known as Aksai Chin. So, one line accepts Aksai Chin as a part of India. The other excludes it from India. But the Maharaja of the state of Jammu and Kashmir accepted the Johnson line. So, this whole Aksai Chin region was considered to be part of Jammu and Kashmir state. So, when India, uh, he, the Maharaja signed an instrument of accession to India, Aksai Chin automatically became part of Indian territory. Now, even the Chinese government had accepted Aksai Chin as part of India for a very long time. As you can see in these couple of maps, which were uh, released by the Chinese government. So, Aksai Chin, this is Aksai Chin here. This is the map. So, this is India. So, basically the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So, this map came out in 1893. Okay, this was released by Wang Ta Chan who was a, who was a Chinese diplomat. So, basically the Chinese government had accepted. Uh, you can argue that Chinese government was weak at that time. It did not have the power to challenge uh, the British and they accepted the, the reality. You can see even in 1917, in the postal map of China, Aksai Chin is shown as part of India here. Okay, the johnson Ardeck line has been accepted by China here. And this policy continued into the 1930s, when, then, uh, when China shifted to the uh, mccartney Macdonald line. Okay, and this was done, uh, so no, no side was clear, both the British and the Chinese kept on changing there position on, on the, uh, the boundary between the two countries. So, right now you can see this area is occupied by, by China. So, this is Indian territory. Okay, this is uh, the, the boundary and China has occupied it. Okay, the India, India claims this to be the territory of India. So, this is known as the western sector and then in Himachal and Uttarakhand also there are some areas where there is some dispute. This is known as the middle sector. Okay, so this is the boundary dispute between India and and China. So uh, I'll stop here. In the next lecture, I am going to go further into the relations between India and China. Thank you very much.
Hello, welcome to the 20 hour course on introduction to Chinese studies. I am Saurabh Sharma, assistant professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. Before this, I was assistant professor of political science in the Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab. I have studied Chinese studies from the Center for East Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I basically teach political science and international relations to undergraduate students. So this course offers you some basic ideas on China that I have learned over the years from teachers of Chinese studies as well as from my own experience interacting with Chinese scholars as well as visiting China. In this particular course there, there are 20 lectures. You can see this is the list of the lectures that we have. Let me briefly go through this list. First lecture would be on the origins of Chinese civilization in which I talk about where the Chinese civilization began, how it began and what are the main ideas that constituted Chinese civilization. The second lecture is on a very, impo on a very important concept in Chinese political thought known as mandate of heaven. So this thought came about in the Zhou dynasty period and it that is about uh, 1000 BCE and since then each coming dynasty has used this concept in order to justify their own rule. Number three Confucianism. Confucianism was the official ideology of the Chinese state for almost 2000 years and the civil service exam in China was based on Confucian classics. So this lecture gives us the details of the Confucian ideas and the important texts re related to Confucianism. Number four is the schools of ancient Chinese thought. So Confucianism is not the only school in Chinese thought. There are other thoughts like legalism, Taoism, Moism and many others. So this lecture would give you a brief account of each of these schools and explain to you how these ideas emerged and what these ideas contained. The fifth lecture would be on religion in China which would go into the ancient religion of China and how these religions have developed over time plus the influence of foreign religions on China and the current status of religion in China. Then number six is society and education in China. So this is going to discuss the social situation in China from a point of view of religion and then uh, discuss the education system in China, especially science and technology and its influence on modern China. Then the next two lectures deal with the concept of century of humiliation. So this period uh, would be from say, uh, around uh, 1839 or 1842, you can take either to 18, uh, 1949 when uh, China, uh, People's Republic of China was established. So this is the Chinese discourse on imperialism. Then the ninth lecture would be on Mao Zedong thought. Mao Zedong was the founding father of the People's Republic of China. So what were his political ideas? Then number 10. Uh, would be on the transition of China to market socialism, how China shifted from Mao's, Mao's thought to market thought. So this uh, began in 1978. So Mao died in 1976 and from 1976 to 1978 there was a transition. And so this particular lecture is going to deal with that transition period. And then we have two lectures on the Chinese political system. China is ruled by the Communist Party of China. So its system is a bit different from say the political system in India or United States or any. So these two lectures will go into details of 
how Chinese political system is organized. Then the next four lectures deal with India-China relations. So first we start with the geopolitics and the boundary dispute. So beginning with uh, say about three nations came into con contact up to uh, 1949 when, when People's Republic of China was established down on the India-China relations. Then we are going to discuss the period from 1949 to 1962. This is a period when there was hindi chini bhai bhai between India and China and then that eventually led to the 1962 war. So this lecture is going to cover both these uh, things, hindi chini bhai bhai as well as the war. And then from 1962 to 1993, we have a period when there was conflict, there were attempts at peace. So we are going to discuss all that. And then finally, 1993 to 2021 is the contemporary period when there is a kind of a strategic competition that has emerged between a rising China and a rising India. Then the 17th lecture would deal with China in the Cold War. So what was China's foreign policy from 1949 to 1980? 89 and I have divided that into three phases. So we are going to discuss those three phases within the Cold War and then in the next lecture we are going to discuss the rise of China that is from the in the post, post Cold War period that is from 1989 to 2023. Uh, I'm, we are going to look at whether the rise of China is a threat, whether it is an opportunity or it's just a myth. In reality China is not actually rising. So we are going to look into these things. The 19th lecture deals with the geo strategy of China. I look into three main uh, aspects of this geo strategy, the trans Himalayan strategy, the string of pearl strategy and the belt and road initiative. And the final lecture deals with soft power in China's foreign policy discourse. This is the, the main subject of my research. So I am going to present uh, different findings from my research in this particular lecture and this is going to be the last lecture. So I hope you uh, listen to these 20 lectures and learn more about China because China is very important from an Indian point of view. China is the largest neighbor of India and it is a rising power, it is a, it's a great power. So China ca can be a threat to India, it can also be an opportunity for India. So we must keep an eye on China and so if we want to keep an eye on China, we should have a basic knowledge about what China is all about to understand its politics, foreign policy, society, civilization, so on and so forth. So I hope this lecture will help you to get a basic understanding of China. Traditional Chinese thought is based on the Confucian cosmology. So it is named after Confucius but this Cosmology is a product of generations of Chinese thinkers and to an extent even today in China a kind of uh, a Confucian uh, mindset exists although it has changed because of the communist revolution. So uh, according to the Confucian cosmology at the top is heaven or Thian. Thian is at the top then below is the earth heaven at the top, earth at the bottom, in the middle is the sun of heaven, Tianzi is the sun of heaven, the Chinese emperor or in modern parlance you will say the Chinese state. So according to the Confucian cosmology, the Chinese state is a, an intermediary between heaven which is the truth, the cosmic law and us that is uh, the people on earth. So state plays a very important role in Chinese thinking and at the center of this whole state system that exists on this earth is Chung Kuo, the Chinese nation. Chung Kuo is the Chinese nation at the center. In the middle is Qing, the capital where the government resides. So government is at the center and then there are the Chinese people and beyond that there are two types of people there are the tributaries and the barbarians. Those people who accept the greatness of Chinese civilization, they follow Chinese leadership are the tributaries and those who refuse to challenge Chinese supremacy are the barbarians. So this is 
the ba a kind of a basic structure of Chinese foreign policy. China gives maximum importance to its own people, its own nation, China first. And then it has friendly relations with those countries which accept the Chinese conditions. China sometimes is very liberal. Those who are ready to accept Chinese conditions, China liberally uh, gives them what they want. But those nations which don't accept the supremacy of China, who challenge Chinese hegemony, they are considered to be barbarians. China looks at them with suspicion and does not cede even a, an inch of ground to uh, these countries which, which are barbarians. So you must keep in mind this Chinese cosmology while uh, the, the Confucian cosmology while studying China's foreign policy. Thank you.